I'd like to welcome you to Oak Hill in Canada. If you brought a Bible, you can open it up over to Philippians, the third chapter. Philippians, the third chapter. And I'm going to start reading uh, about the seventh verse, and I don't know how far I might read to the end. Some things that, uh, that I do want to talk about, I pray that God will bless them. Yeah. <clears throat> Seventh verse, third chapter, Philippians says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ? Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ. Now you got to realize here, Paul, Paul gave up everything. Paul was deeply steeped in Judaism, and on his experience on Damascus Road, totally changed Paul's life forever. Now Paul has went from being one of the good old boys to the rebel. Paul was on his way with papers in hand to persecute and to destroy every Christian that he found. And all of a sudden, by God's grace, he finds himself now in the very presence of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And the Lord himself is speaking to him and strikes him down, blinds him, and forever changes the course of his life. So now Paul has went from being a prestigious Jew to one that has been labeled as one who betrayed his people. And so now he's outside the camp. The Jews now that loved him because he was persecuting the Christians now have hated him. And so he says, Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And then he says, And do count them but dumb that I may win Christ. He has the knowledge that he has not only suffered everything that he had as a loss for Christ's sake, but he's willing to count the rest of everything in life loss. And he throws it all on what he's calling a dunghill, a manure heap. In other words, he counts the world, the, the religion of the Jews, and his life in particular that he used to live, all a waste. It's just a waste to him. So, we go on and he says, And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him. Think about that. Now it's at this point, when he makes that statement, that I may know him, he's not speaking from a standpoint of he's already met Christ at Damascus. So when he says that I may know him, he's not talking about, oh, that I may get to know him. But he's coming from a standpoint that I really may get to know him with my whole heart, get to know Him. Now, there's a lot of people that know about Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. I asked my daddy one time. I said, Daddy, I said, do you believe there was a man named Jesus that he went to the cross? He said, yes, sir. But he looked at me and he said, that didn't save me. 
And that's what I was fishing for. The knowledge of a historical man by the name of Jesus Christ will not save you. The Bible says the devils believe. The devil himself and the demons, they believe. And tremble. <clears throat> Fear and tremble. So it takes what Paul is actually saying here in this 10th verse that I may know him. And then he elaborates on it. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Jesus, if you will remember, when he came to Mary and Martha, And they said, if you'd have been here, our brother would not have died. But we know even now, whatever you ask, your father will give it. And Jesus' answer says, he'll live again. And they said, oh, we know he'll live again in the resurrection. And Jesus just lays the truth out and says, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection. What we're getting at is a formal, historical, carnal knowledge of Jesus will not save you. It will not, it will not bring life to you. Put yourself in the place of Lazarus. You're in the tomb. You're dead in your sin. You're dead in your trespass. You're dead in all of your area. Your will, your understanding, your knowledge is all off track. You are dead by a carnal mind as far as Jesus is concerned. So Paul realizes that. And Paul pins that I may know him. <clears throat> And then he elaborates and says that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. The power of his resurrection is where the power is at. Yes. There's believing and then there's believing to the saving of the soul. Amen. And the believing to the saving of the soul is done through the drawing power and the Holy Ghost as it applies the benefits of the blood of Christ to an unsaved individual. By grace, through faith. And the steps of that are God first begins to draw you by the Spirit. When God truly begins to draw you, you begin to respond. He sets a godly sorrow up in your heart. The godly sorrow will lead you somewhere to get down between you and God and to repent because of sin. Yeah. So the drawing power leads to a godly sorrow. A godly sorrow will cause a burden of guilt to be present in your soul. And that burden of guilt will lead you to the cross of Christ to unload the burden of guilt. Yes. And you do that through repentance. You get down on your knees and you literally pour your heart out, you come in a broken state knowing that there's nothing you can do. I, I can remember when that first occurred to me, there's nothing I can do to, to find salvation. Amen. Never was a big drinker, but I quit drinking. Didn't smoke much, quit smoking. I didn't get out and run around and whore around, but I, I quit all that kinds of thoughts. I was trying in my own way to find righteousness by my works. And that didn't work. The more I tried to find God by my own way of righteousness, the heavier the burden got. Because I couldn't find any way in my ideology,
to rid myself of the burden of guilt. This is what Paul's talking about here. That I may know Him in the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering being made conformable unto His death. You'll have to threaten them with that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what he's saying here is this. The drawing power of God comes through His Spirit. It draws you to a place where a godly sorrow sets up. And because of the godly sorrow in your heart, there is a burden of guilt. We call it conviction. Under conviction. And that conviction will cause you to begin to repent to God because of the sin that's loaded in the convicting power of your heart and you know between you and God, I'm a sinner. Then you've got to find resurrection power. When you come as an empty-handed beggar to God, you come in a broken state realizing there's nothing I can do. It's outside the scope of my power. If you don't save me, God, I'm lost forever and will end in the devil's hell. Amen. That's what crossed my mind. That's what crossed my heart when I was praying. But then Paul goes on here and he says, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering. There is some suffering to be done here. When a soul is under conviction and the burden of guilt is on his back and he finds that he is laid prostrate, praying and asking and begging God to forgive him and it doesn't come and it doesn't come, their suffering sets in. I realized I was lost and headed to hell. And there was nothing I could do to stop that train from running over me. And I kept begging God, forgive me Lord, forgive me Lord, forgive me Lord. But then, after I had begged for, for forgiveness, and I began to, to look to God instead of self. And I got a true glimpse of Jesus Christ on the cross. He that knew no sin, that was made sin for me, that I could be made the righteousness of God in Him. Then I saw myself in a sense as sitting on the bench and someone took my place on the field. And when I got a true look, at the cross of Jesus Christ, all of a sudden, the burden rolled off me. Praise God. And what had taken place, Paul describes it in these words. Being made conformable unto his death. Before you can have life in Jesus Christ, you have to realize first that there's death in you. When you realize that the death in you has all to do with the life in Christ, then you're, you're willing at that point to die dead to the love of sin. Whatever it takes, God, just save my soul. That's what I said. That's how the old brothers preached. You reach a point where you just literally say, whatever you want of me, I'm willing to give it, even unto death. I want to be made conformable to your death. When that happens, life immediately floods in. God's Holy Ghost will fill you up. That burden rolls away and glory sets right down in your soul. It goes on to say, If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Paul's saying, I realize I'm not perfect, but I am forgiven. Thank you, Jesus. I have taken place by grace through faith in the resurrection of Yes. of Jesus Christ and I have passed from my death unto Christ's life. Yes. Yet I'm not perfect. But I'm following
following hard after how to find to get to be perfect. Yeah. Every Christian that's truly born again has a heart that says, I would be just like Christ, sinless. Yes. But because sin is condemned in this old flesh, the soul is what saved, the soul is what has been resurrected, and this body is waiting in hope. What's his hope? The hope is that when Jesus comes back, this sinful mortal body where sin is right in it will be changed like an unto Jesus. And when that occurs, when Jesus comes back and my hope stands before me and the resurrection of the dead comes out of the ground, my body then will be conformed exactly to Jesus Christ and all the sin that's condemned in this body will be gone. Then I'll have a perfect soul, a perfect spirit, and a perfect body. And I'll be made conformable then unto Jesus. Exactly. Same image. And the old writer said, then will I be satisfied. So, here's what we got. He says, brethren... I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Stop right there. Forgetting those things which are behind. Don't look back. There ain't nothing good back there. Before Jesus Christ saved me, I was a shipwrecked sinner. You go to a shrink and the shrink will say, well, let's go into back, look back, let's look into your past. God here says, don't look back. Not back there, but shipwreck. Look forward. Everyone has a past. Everyone is a sinner. Everyone has a past. I don't care who you are. President Trump has a past. Ron Sloan has a past. Lindy Lou has a past. The question God's asking is, do you have a future? And a hope. Do you have a future? Yes. The future is only in Jesus. That's the true future. Praise God. Other than that, all you have is death. Everyone's going to come forth in the resurrection. Everyone is coming out of the ground. The good and the bad. The good is those that have believed to the saving of the soul. They're going with Jesus. Praise the, Lord. the bad are those that didn't take the time to repent and be forgiven. They're headed down to death. 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 Where the worm dieth not. And the fires never quench. Don't look back. I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind. Forget the things that are behind. If Paul looked back, what do you think he saw? He sees himself standing there holding the garments while everybody picks up a rock and kills somebody that God loved. Stephen crying upon the name of the Lord. And they're all looking back. Paul could see was, oh my God. I wonder how many times that played out in his heart when God started working with him. All he saw was I stood there and cheered him on as they killed one of God's people. Don't look back. Nothing good back there. All Paul could see was all the death and destruction and all the havoc that he wreaked upon the church of God that Jesus came and shed his blood for. And you're in the same boat, every one of you. I'm in the same boat. If we look back, that's all we see. 
And that's what I repented of. Forgive me, Lord. A sinner, forgive me. Don't look back. He goes on to say, I count not myself to have apprehended but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded and if in anything ye be otherwise minded God shall reve reveal even this unto you. Looking back. How are you living today? Little illustration that I saw. And I really enjoyed that man's ministry. He had a great message. Time and eternity is stamped in every individual. There's a part of us that is time oriented. It's going back to the dust of the ground when it dies. If you're in Christ, it'll come forth. But there's also an eternal part called the soul that resides in us. An inward man and an outward man. I ask the question, how are you living? What are you living for? Every person's life is based on a timeline that actually started before the foundation of the world, the old writer said, he knew me when I, before I was in my mother's womb. You come in through birth, and your, your timeline begins on an earthly mode. And it's headed towards an eternal mode. Because that which is born of a woman is going back to the dust that part of that body. And so there's a timeline. We'll say this is the timeline. The earthly part of the timeline, if you look at it, would be this silver thing. That part. That's your earthly part. You that are living for the present. You that are living for now. You that are living for the carnal things of this world. You that are just worried about what you can get by gain. You're living for that much of your timeline. Guess what? Here's what lays out ahead of you. Eternity. No end. Eternity. You want to make it about the little earthly part? I'd sell my brother out for a nickel. I'd kill somebody for a pair of tennis shoes. I would lie, cheat, and steal to have a big new home. You're living for that little segment. Not realizing all of eternity is out before you. What are you living for? People, I've had people walk up to me and say, you ain't nothing but a fanatic. And I just look at them and say, you're living for this much. I'm living for this. No end. What are you living for? You that don't know Jesus. Do you not know you can gain the whole world and lose your soul? What would you give? You that never prayed a prayer. In life. 
will spend all of eternity begging, praying with no hope. None. Me? I'll take Paul's advice. I ain't looking back. And I ain't living for this little segment. But I'm going to give God all that I am and live for this. I'm pressing on towards the mark, the prize, the high calling in Jesus.